the candle or whatever the patient has to offer. The Jesus Maria Hospital can assist 40,000 people in this extremely rugged region. There are people who won't go to the hospital, so the hospital goes to them. This family is receiving immunizations and vitamins. For the smallest children, it's the very first time they've ever seen a doctor. I feel very good about them because they help us. The family now has medical records and appointments to come to the hospital for future care. This outreach program lets the hospital gain the trust of a community uneasy about white coats. The people of Jesus Maria are now more willing to reach out for help when they need it the most. This baby suffers from severe malnutrition. His grandparents brought him here, but native treatments are not an option. Only medical formulas will save his life. The curandero understands this, and now so does the baby's family. Sí, ya sabes. This cooperation is the approach the hospital strives to achieve. Ay, qué rico. Mm. So that kindergarten children in Jesus Maria will grow up with the advantages of modern medicine while continuing to celebrate their past. The problem of increasing temperatures may not feel vivid on the beaches of the Caribbean. After all, this region is always quite warm. But strange developments are connecting these islands to a climate change event thousands of miles away. The story begins with a surprising rise of a disease. Physician Michelle Montiel has long felt her home island of Trinidad is a great place to grow up. But lately, she's begun having doubts. Every day, she confronts a medical mystery that hangs like a shadow over the entire region. For growing numbers of children here, the simple act of breathing is becoming a challenge. Confronted by the suffering asthma was causing, Montiel dedicated herself to investigating this growing epidemic. I cannot remember having any asthmatic friends. I cannot remember any children in my schools having inhalers. Nowadays, I would say it's a common problem, and that is the perception among the medical fraternity here in Trinidad. I found that there was almost nothing written about asthma or allergic diseases in Trinidad. So, as a result, I embarked on my research in this area. Incredibly, the reason would involve something the region has known for thousands of years, dust. Dust from thousands of miles away. You're listening to WVWI in St. Thomas, the U.S. Virgin Islands. It looks like we're going to have some hot and sunny skies over the next couple of days into the weekend. But early into next week, forecasters are predicting a Saharan dust event coming our way. Dry weather, hazy skies in the forecast. Up next, some new music. Fifty years ago, Lake Chad was one of Africa's great lakes. Water stretched as far as the eye could see. But a decades-long drought reduced Lake Chad to one twentieth of its former area. This part of the world has always had cycles of drought. But this one's been especially harsh. No one is sure if global climate change or some other factor is driving it. Whatever the cause, the result is more dust. And lately, more and more of this dust is getting swept into the air and blown toward the Americas thousands of miles away.
Back in Trinidad, Michelle Montiel and her team believe they have found a pattern between Saharan dust and the rise of childhood asthma. We have found that, in fact, when we have Sahara dust cover, there is an increase in the number of asthmatic children coming to the accident in the emergency departments with worsened asthma a day after the events. Marine biologist Ginger Garrison is also investigating Saharan dust. She thinks the dust is carrying an unidentified but harmful pathogen that also affects the ocean's reefs. So she's now training local residents on a number of islands to collect air samples. What's coming over into the Caribbean and what you and I are breathing here on the particles that get into our lungs. And so we're talking about endocrine disruptors, carcinogens, mutagens, um, trying to see what kind of nasty stuff there is. It's dusty today and we need as much sample as we can get. She hopes to get samples from Africa soon too. But as the case linking Saharan dust with Caribbean diseases gets stronger, a nagging question remains. Dust has been blowing over the Atlantic for millennia, so why are we seeing these problems now? Surprisingly, some of these answers can be found in Colorado. That's where Jim Hurrell spends his time. He's obsessed with the inner workings of the global climate system especially a remarkable feature of the atmosphere that sits over the Atlantic. Two gigantic air masses, one high pressure, the other low. It's called the North Atlantic Oscillation because the high and the low fluctuate in strength season to season and year to year. Together, these two air masses propel Atlantic storms across the sea. When the system's in high gear, it draws those storms far to the north, changing temperature and precipitation patterns over much of northern Europe and Eurasia. At the same time, the winds around the southern edge of the high pressure mass propel African dust toward the Americas. Sailors and climate scientists alike have long considered this system unpredictable. But lately, a pattern has emerged, one that caught the eye of this atmospheric scientist. What we find is that the North Atlantic Oscillation does not behave the way it's been behaving over the last 20 or 30 years. The only way that you can get that behavior is by increasing concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Somehow, Earth's rising temperature is affecting the year-to-year -year behavior of this massive atmospheric system. But how? In solving one mystery, Jim Hurrell had uncovered another. He began to focus on one area of the world where average temperature has been rising particularly fast, the Indian Ocean. When he added the rise in Indian Ocean temperatures to his computer climate model, the fixed pattern in the North Atlantic suddenly reappeared. Hurl thinks he knows how the warming of this distant ocean could affect the atmosphere over the North Atlantic. As the tropical oceans warm, it produces more rainfall over the tropical Indian Ocean. This is really a burst of heat energy to the atmosphere that can perturb the atmospheric flow for thousands of miles downstream from the Indian Ocean. This energy ripples through the atmosphere like a wave in a pool. When it reaches the North Atlantic, it reinforces the energy of the North Atlantic Oscillation, producing the pattern we've seen in recent decades and driving more African dust to the Americas. What's emerging is this amazing picture of global connections where one part of the globe can be connected to another thousands of miles away. The complexity and the large-scale linkages that are global um, that are involved in this entire process are mind-boggling to me. Simply put, the warming of the Indian Ocean affects the North Atlantic Oscillation. And that affects how the dust gets mobilized in the Sahara. 
which then throws dust into the air being blown over to the Caribbean. I think that what my foray into this area has really done for me is that it has really brought out to me how we are really just one globe. We are one, one world and how we, events from one part of the world can impact so forcibly on you in a totally different part of the world. I've never visited Africa. It seems a million miles away, but in fact, changes there are affecting us here in the Caribbean. It's a war being fought with U.S. funding, U.S. military guidance, and combat involving American contractors. But this isn't Afghanistan or Iraq. It's Colombia, a country in the midst of a war less visible to most Americans, even though it's much closer to our own borders. Some 90% of all illegal cocaine used in the U.S. comes through Colombia, much of it grown there. The U.S. government links this problem to the war on terror. It's so important for Americans to know that the traffic in drugs finances the work of terror, sustaining terrorists. The terrorists use drug profits to fund their cells to commit acts of murder. The U.S. and Colombian governments are trying to persuade farmers to stop growing coca, but it's a tough sell. Coffee is one alternative cash crop, although not as lucrative as coca. In this southern Colombian town, farmers bring their coffee beans to market. Coffee is a lot of work. We have to collect it, pile it, wash it, and dry it to sell it at a good price. And the world market for coffee is unstable with the potential for major drops in price. But some farmers, like René Chaux, have formed cooperatives to shield against the shocks of the market. The idea is to encourage growers to quit coca. The majority of people complain about the low prices of coffee. So they rely on the incentive of the agricultural production of coca because logically, the price of cocaine is much higher than the price of coffee. René is on his way to visit Evelio Menesa, a farmer who's made the switch from coca to coffee. Coffee growers barely cover their costs. Still, Menesa believes he's doing the right thing. There are many problems with coca, no? There are too many problems with the drug. And that's why I stopped growing coca, after seeing so many family conflicts. Now, I have real peace with my family and my neighbors, but I have scarce resources to make a decent living. This coca farmer explains why he grows the illegal crop. Well, it is harmful, but it doesn't do any damage here. If we didn't grow it, our families wouldn't have anything to eat. Colombia's drug war is a fight against both cocaine growers and anti-government guerrillas who draw funding from drug money. United States involvement in the conflict is massive. In the year 2003 alone, U.S. military aid to Colombia totaled $600 million. These members of the U.S. trained Colombian anti-narcotics police are preparing to go on a search and destroy mission to find a cocaine lab hidden deep in the jungle. The unit is combat ready. One of their aircraft was fired on just the day before this mission. Destroying the coca plants with herbicide is a significant part of the U.S. war effort. U.S. law limits the number of troops allowed on Colombian soil, so instead, the U.S. hires contractors, like DynCorp, based in Reston, Virginia, to do the spraying. Many of the pilots are ex-military from all over the Americas, including the U.S. The spray, which kills any plant it touches, is controversial. To minimize damage to forests and legitimate crops, Satellites guide the spraying. Each mission is accompanied by helicopter gunships for fire support. This flight mission encountered no fire, 
but a few days later, one of the planes was shot down, killing the Costa Rican pilot. Colombia's president, Alvaro Uribe, ties his fight against rebels and drugs to the war on terrorism. This is a, a challenge set by terrorists, by narco-traffickers, against a uh, democratic society, the Colombian democratic society. Despite Urube's determination and U.S. aid, Colombian growers still produce enough of their crop to generate over 400 metric tons of cocaine a year. Small planes are the most convenient way to travel around Kenya, but this one can't quite get me where I want to go. So after touchdown on this small and dusty airstrip, I get some help. Okay. A short walk and we hit water. This place looks and feels completely different than the Kenya I've already seen. For me, stepping onto this island is like stepping back in time. Cannon from another era still stand guard. Craftsmen carve magnificent doors by hand. And there's only one car on the island. It belongs to the district commissioner, and he doesn't seem to use it much. Lamu is the oldest town in Kenya and on the ancient and very narrow streets. One of the most popular ways to get around is by donkey. Last year, the old town of Lamu was placed on the United Nations list of World Heritage Sites. Many of the buildings date back hundreds of years. While the most obvious influence is Arabic, Lamu and its people absorb whatever they come in contact with. Karib, welcome. Sheikh Ahmad Badawi's family has lived here for 10 generations. Lamu is a cradle of Swahili civilization. This is where uh, everybody depends on learning about the Swahili culture. It's a culture built on commerce. As far back as the 14th century, Lamu was a vibrant economic center, an Indian Ocean trading post. Ships from China, India, Arabia, and Portugal sailed in and out, carrying everything from mahogany and mangrove, spices, and slaves. Those merchants.